Hi, I'm Ted Nelson. This is yet another attempt to explain my Xanadu project, which I've been explaining in different ways for over half a century. And it's had to be a different explanation for each generation. In the 1960s, I tried to tell people about interactive text on screens. In the 1970s and 1980s, by which time people had interactive screens, I mostly tried to tell people about jump links. Except for those who were really interested, I told the main story in my book, Literary Machines, 1981, starting with what we now call the Humanist Edition. This was the original Silver Mylar Edition. It's a collector's item. Someone just found me a copy. And later, the Technical Edition, which I showed in the last video. with the tales I'll talk about in Xanadu Basics 2. Then came the World Wide Web in the 1990s, and I've had a hard time explaining what the web isn't because most people can only imagine what they've already seen. For this mini-series of videos, I've figured out a new explanation, broken down very differently, refactored, as they say. So in the first video of this series, Xanadu Basics 1A, I explained that the central concept <coughs> is visible connection. I never thought of explaining it that way before. <clears throat> Visible connection. <clears throat> I'm trying to build interactive document software you can use to read and write visibly connected documents, visibly connected interactive documents. These connections are completely different from the jump links of the World Wide Web where you have an anchor on the website and you jump to something else. That's how web, that's web links, that's all you get. <clears throat> on the web there is no visible connection between pages, whereas consider our idea of visible connection. We've prototyped it numerous times, just to remind you from Xanadu Basics 1A. Xanadu links visibly connect to other content with a visible bridge. The other documents open and I can scroll around in them. This is not merely an opposite kind of hypertext from the World Wide Web, but it is a total alternative to conventional computer documents. Microsoft Word, PDF, eBooks, the lot. They imitated paper. Why? When you can have a real... Why imitate paper on, inter on an interactive screen when you can have real interactive documents? I think of visibly connected pages as the basic literature that the human race needs, what I think of as decent documents. I had the advantage of imagining such a system before individuals owned computers, and before computer screens were available, I could make it up in my own mind. Because once people had seen text on screens, it became even harder to explain. Unfortunately, people are now fixated on what they've al they're already used to, and have a hard time imagining anything else. Okay. I'm not just a complainer, I'm a designer with a basic design much older and deeper than the web which I still intend to make a place for. Not just as another form of hypertext for the internet, there's no replacing the World Wide Web, but as a fundamental new literature, an alternative to Microsoft Word and PDF. Note that the psychological theory of cognitive dissonance predicts that most people will be annoyed by these ideas, and after seeing any of these videos, will become more entrenched in current paradigms than ever before. People who are committed to Microsoft Word and or the web will consider these ideas stupid, crazy, silly, deranged, deluded, unnecessary, incomprehensible, bad, evil, and too late. Only a few people on the margins who are not inured to or immured in the current paradigm will be swayed by what I say and show. But that doesn't matter. If we can get a decent document system going, I hope in my lifetime, presumably in open source, it will take off on its own. So in the previous video, Xanadu Basics 1A, I showed several more examples of interactive visible connection between page parallel pages. If you're not clear on that, please go back and watch Xanadu Basics 1A. Okay, the conventional method of document delivery, lump files. Conventional document software, including Microsoft Word and HTML, is based on lump files and putting the formatting codes into a lump file. In almost all systems of text formatting, like Microsoft Word, <coughs> the 
A document consists of a single file that sits on your computer as a lump or gets emailed as a lump, and the formatting, paragraphing, and font information is embedded in that lump. Here are the, so here are the paragraph, here's the heading, paragraph, italics, etc. Computer scientists outside Microsoft tried to create a non-Microsoft standard for formatting inside lump files. IBM created the general markup language for formatting inside lumps, which became SGML with formatting codes put inside angle brackets. When Tim Berners-Lee designed the web page file, HTML, he accepted and, ex and extended that standard lump system. <clears throat> so Tim's original HTML files were based on SGML. It was a natural choice for Tim to use what was already there, and he chose to put the links into that lump inside angle brackets, just like the paragraphs, italics, and other formatting. Formatting that SGML was already putting between angle brackets. Putting the limps in, links into the lump means they can only be one way, pointing outward. They can't be two ways. So for now, please forget about the web. I'll talk about the compatibility problems in another video. So what's the alternative to lump files? Instead of a lump file with all the content and connection <coughs> inside the lump, we send a file that is a list of text content to send for and links to send for. Send for list. <coughs> content portion address and link addresses. The contents are portions of text which can be anywhere on the internet. The links are tables which can be anywhere on the internet. And we leave it to your viewing machine to send for them because they can come from all over. Consider how an internet file request works. When your computer requests a file from somewhere on the net, a web page, a PDF, or some system file, your machine sends out a request to a specific server, and the file comes if you're lucky. Just as the web viewer sends for an HTML file, the Xanadu viewer sends for an EDL file. So your viewing computer receives the send for list, sends for and assembles the portions of text, and sends for the links, and then applies the links to the text. Unpacking the list, we assemble the content, then apply the links, which allows two-way Xenolinks. <clears throat> From that list, your viewing machine builds the views you want, showing the connections you want to see. This gives you visible two-way links, if you like. If you have two connected pages open, you can follow the link in either direction from either page to the other. So a link is a table of connections, a <coughs> file to be sent for, and we'll call our links Xanalinks, so you won't confuse them with web links. We'll talk about Xanalinks in detail in another video. Now, for simplicity, I've been saying send for list, but it already had a name in Hollywood. It's really called an edit decision list. Windy on the street. It's really called an edit decision list, or EDL. <coughs> That's a movie industry term. When a film is made, an edit decision list gives directions for building a movie from individual shots. Take this part of shot A and that part of shot B, <coughs> specify <coughs> each individual portion of video to put into the sequence. So the Xanadu team in 1979 invented that concept independently for hypertext content, and we later found out it was the same as the Hollywood EDL. Using a Xanadu edit decision list, the text and links may be brought from different places all over and combined as the author chooses. And by this method, each portion retains its connection to the source. The text and links can come from multiple sources anywhere on the internet, but they'd better be stable and unchanging. That's for another discussion. There's a lot left for you to figure out, some of which will, I hope, become clearer in later videos. Other ramifications of indirect delivery by EDL. Bridges to sources. In the previous video 1A, I showed two kinds of connection, visible links, which we've just covered, and bridges to sources. We've just discussed the links or Xana links, now for the bridges to sources. Haven't you sometimes wanted to check the original content from which a quote is taken? Haven't you wanted to look at the original book, government document, email, which is being quoted from? Well, the indirect document also allows that. Bridges to the original, what we call source transclusion. Here at a Xanadu Cambridge page, we see how connection to original sources ought to work. 
What we've got here outlined in orange is content brought in from elsewhere, but it's not just a pasted quotation, it's a live connection to the original. So if the reader wants to scroll around, see the original context, or read further beyond that quotation, it's right there. These are live quotes, or what we call transclusions. Following the edit decision list, each quotation comes in from an original source chosen by the author. Content brought from a source is generally called transclusion, another word which I coined, look it up. But Xanadu transclusion is special. In Xanadu source transclusion, because the edit decision list shows where that original came from, your viewing program can create a visible bridge from the quotation to the original. You can cross this bridge and use it to see and compare the original context. Naturally, we want these transclusion bridges to look different from link bridges, but that's an interface issue, a user choice. Okay, local transclusion. Our design also has local transclusion, which unfortunately I can't show in a video. That simply means your viewing program shows what contents are the same in the Xanadox you have open. Identical contents discovered in the open pages by your Xanadu viewer. Local transclusion can be used for many things, for example, version compare. So this part is the same. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking at the mirror image. This part is the same as... <laughs> this part is the same as this. This part is the same as... <laughs> this. <laughs> okay. So these are, just, these are identities discovered by the Xanadu viewer. And remember that we showed you version compare in the Declaration of Independence. This is one way that local transclusion can look. Okay, deep breath. Another power of the indirect document, micropayment for content sale. Micropayment was a part of our hypertransaction system at Keio University. We'll be discussing that in another video. We also demonstrate micropayment in the video New Game in Town. You can watch it on YouTube. However, it's just a prototype demo. A deployable system is beyond our present capabilities. To conclude about indirect document delivery, this is a fundamental method that needs to be understood by computer scientists as well as put to practical use. The indirect method can be used for other kinds of documents as well, but it's inside out from all of the computer documents. It's especially for hypertext with visible connections, but back in the day, <laughs> my team and I thought all documents would be hypertext with visible connections. I hope that the validity of this work will be eventually recognized and it can eventually be deployed at scale. Thank you.